Okay. All right. Um, so this is called Wolf Nations from Burtuccino to Bozkurt, uh, the uses of Turco-Mongol origin mythology in modern Turkic nationalism. So um, I'll just start by saying, you know, this is sort of a, a side interest of mine is um, the history of, of the wolf and the folklore in various societies. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, depressed about politics in the Middle East. And so this is sort of a, uh, an escape for me, I suppose. All right. So when Mehmet Ali Aja was arrested on May 13th of 1981 after attempting to assassinate the Polish Pope John Paul II during his weekly general audience in Rome's St. Peter's Square, the world's attention was suddenly drawn for the first time to a right-wing ultra-nationalist faction in Turkey called Bozkurtular, or the Grey Wolves. A Turkish criminal who had joined the secretive organization in the 1970s Aja was previously arrested, charged, and convicted in absentia for the murder of Milliet newspaper's liberal e editor, Abdi Ipekci, killed in Istanbul in 1979. Aja had escaped from a military prison that fall. He had left a note in his cell condemning, quote, Western imperialists who are afraid of Turkey's unity of political, military, and economic power with the brotherly Islamic countries, end quote seemingly threatening the Pope's pending visit to Turkey in November of 1979. Turkish security was tightened, but no assassination took place. Aja, who had later managed to enter Italy, inserted himself into the throngs of spectators eagerly awaiting the Pope's appearance that day in Rome. He did manage to shoot the Pope and also wounded two female bystanders in the crowd, seriously injuring them before he was grabbed and held. Aja was arrested, pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. The Pope, the most critically wounded, survived, as did the women. Suddenly, the, the phrase gray wolves was appearing in the headlines of international newspapers. Aja had, had claimed initially to have acted alone, but then his erotic statements and his past linkage to the Bozkurt Dular organization began leading to further inquiries into just who these gray wolves were. Did they order the assassination? Was this a Turkish terrorist organization? Who were they? What was their motivation and ideology? How connected was, was this group to Turkey? The Grey Wolves, or in Turkish, Bozkurt Jalaj, was an organization originally established in 1969 by Colonel Alparslan Turkesh, a Cypriot-born Turk military officer who, was, who founded Turkey's far-right national movement party, the Milieci Hareket Partisi, or the Mehepe, around 1969. The Grey Wolves were officially known as the Ulku Ojaklara and its youth society, the Ulkuju Genslik, to imply a cultural and educational mission. However, they, were, they are more readily understood to be the unofficial militant arm of the party. The Grey Wolves in the past have carried out terrorist activities, including bomb attacks and assassinations of public officials, um, left-wing journalists and, and activists, academics, intellectuals, and students, lawyers and labor organizations in the 1970s and 1980s. They were clandestinely contracted to bomb or assassinate those seen as threatening the sovereignty of Turkey in any way, whether activist ethnic Kurds or the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party leaders, um, with their Kurdish separatist demands, or members of a terrorist organization called the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armeni Armenia, ASALA is the acronym which had attempted by means of guerrilla attacks to assist in establishing an Armenia in Eastern Anatolia and Soviet Armenia, as well as compelling Turkey to accept responsibility for the Armenian genocide. The Grey Wolves bombed the Armenian Genocide Memorial in Paris in 1984. The image of Bozkurt or Grey Wolf is still today the unmistakable icon of a more radical political right-wing party of Turkey. Vendors on the streets of Turkish cities still sell keychains and banners um, with the Bozkurt and Crescent Moon emblem on the red background, with slogans printed on them, such as Yasev Yaterket, love it or leave it, to inspire their partisans. And these are just a couple of those kind of images. A hand gesture resembling a wolf's head is a physical indication of support for the ultra-nationalist or Ukuju platform. Where did this Turkish wolf imagery originate? And why is wolf iconography so deeply ingrained as a Turkish national emblem? What is it about the wolf that seems to be such an attractive symbol for far-right political movements? After all, wolves have made their way into ultra-nationalist fascist military iconography in other societies as well. 
with the most prominent example being Germany during World War II. There, the wolf was resurrected from its rather malevolent image in medieval Europe to a positive one in the 20th century by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. They embraced the Aryan wolf to symbolize the power of discipline and hierarchy underpinning German military strategy and might, all of which would defeat what they considered the decadence inspired by Jewish outsiders and French or Gallic influences in their lands. And these are just a couple of images here. As animal historian Marvin in, describes, quote, in a newspaper article in 1922, Hitler wrote that the German people had realized that a wolf has been born, destined to burst upon the herd of seducers and deceivers of the people. He, of course, was that wolf of salvation. This is a reversal of the biblical image of the dangerous ravaging wolf attacking a defenseless flock. Here it is the herd that is evil and the wolf, the creature from outside that will the, the creature from outside that will destroy them. Later, Hitler reportedly referred to the SS as my pack of wolves. In keeping with this imagery, three of Hitler's headquarters from which he planned his predations had wolfish names. In France, he had the wolf Schult, the wolf's gulch. In Ukraine, the werewolf. And in East Prussia, the wolf Schanz, the wolf's lair. And the picture on the, on the right that you see there is actually um, an anti-racist leftist who made these statues um, in 2015, I think it was, um, to sort of make Germans aware that you know Nazi ideology is still alive and well. And this whole, the, all of these statues actually went on tour. Hitler youth used as soldiers were known as werewolves. German U-boats donned the nickname wolf packs in the Second World War because of the submarine tactics used in which they would quickly group together for an attack once a target was located. So how can we explain this iconographic wolf, the Bozkurt, as the Turkish ultranationalist symbol of the nation? Why did ultranationalist Turks call themselves gray wolves? Before delving into the specific origins of Turkish Bozkurtlar imagery, we must acknowledge that among peoples attempting to define and establish an identity grounded in their understanding of their own unique antiquity, traditional folklore and epic stories of a people's survival against all odds are often deployed in various ways in order to justify national existence. In the modern era, this in turn leads to the demand for self-determination, entitlement to statehood and independence. Within this paradigm, the wolf is an animal whose image as a powerful predator and resourceful hunter has often uh, been noticeably visible in the national folklore and iconography of many cultures, often regardless of whether people's views of wolves has been typically positive or negative in their history and legends. The, the wolves are you know, one of those sort of what we call in, in uh, animal studies, charismatic megafauna, right? A great predator to whom humanity is escapably drawn. Wolves activities in nature and their position as a top predator in ecosystems has proven them an attractive symbol of an inter, inner spiritual and national strength as a defender of their territory, as a cohesive pack capable of carrying out impressive attacks to guarantee the livelihood and survival of the larger national group. This metaphor of the wolf can also transfer seamlessly into the iconography and military ideology of many nations conducting either defensive or colonial and imperialist actions. Like other civilizations, empires, and countries, in many Turkic cultures, the wolf plays a prominent role in folkloric traditions that define who the Turks were and are, who their enemies have been, how they have traversed the centuries as nomadic warriors and imperial rulers, how they've been saved from extermination, and how some Turkic peoples have achieved modern nationhood while others are still engaged in that ongoing struggle. Nationalism as a theoretical framework for defining identity typically requires several discernible features. One of which is that a people have a history, a shared past, an antiquity recognizable as their particular cultural possession, whether it's real or imagined, which serves as the basis upon which to demand these obvious political aspirations. This antiquity of a nation is part of what binds a people together in addition to ethnicity and language. Their antiquity has an origin or a genesis. It requires a homeland. There is a golden age, usually followed by internal deterioration of the nation's high civilization, or their having been vanquished by rivals and enemies. And then a reawakening, 
often led by particular historic or heroic figures. In the 19th century, Turkish nationalist Ottoman Turks and Turkic exiles from outside Anatolia increasingly viewed themselves as bound together due to a secular, racial, and linguistic heritage, which entitled them to remain at the helm of an Ottoman Turkish empire and to continue to rule over other minorities. In the aftermath of World War I, when the empire had collapsed, a new modern Turkish nation arose from the ashes of Ottoman defeat. The pre-Islamic Central Asian Turco-Mongol mythology of Turkic origins became an attractive tool to denote the foundation, survival, and genius of this newborn ethno-linguistically Turkish nation. At the center of this mythology was the wolf, that powerful predatory symbol of Turkic strength that overcame its Central Asian adver adversaries in pre-modern times. Though the wolf got forgotten for a period of centuries soon after Turkic empires of the medieval era, such as the Seljuks and then the Ottomans came to dominate the Middle East, Bozkurt was resurrected anew in the 20th century as a metaphor to represent the dynamism of the emerging modern Turkish nation, the Turkish Republic. So then we have to look at the, the mythology a little bit. So, you know, in some ways, um, 19th century British views of the Afghans as wolf-like barbarians, as they call them in the sources, resembled ancient imperial China's attitudes towards the Turkic and Mongol pastoral nomads on their empire's Central Asian frontiers. However, in this regard, Chinese perceptions were actually aided by the oral traditions emanating from animist Turks and Mongols themselves. Various Turkic and Mongol origin myths claiming ancient connections to either a she-wolf or an actual wolf ancestor among these pre-Islamic Central Asian peoples were actually first recorded in the Chinese dynastic annals in which the Chinese imperial forces tried to determine who these marauding enemy nomads were. Over time, various versions of these wolf myths that had circulated among Central Asian peoples sometimes blended together elements of one or another story. The legends were modified depending on circumstance or need. Some were Islamized after Turks and Mongols converted to Islam and the early Turkic language used to describe the wolf changed as well. So there's kind of a combination of, of Turkic and Mongol myth that I'm gonna talk about here. The Chinese Shi Qi and the Han Shu completed in the first century before the common era and the first century of the common era respectively, or the Chu Shu, the Sui Shu and the Pei Shi all completed around the mid to late seventh century and compiled from earlier texts that have now been lost describe the origin myths of a people they call the Chuche, or Turks. The earliest oral Turkic folk traditions relayed from these Chinese uh, sources, the Shichi and Hanshu, tell of a people called the Wusun, a nomadic people of Northwestern China who migrated frequently during the Han period. And the Han period is from the third century before the common era all the way up to the third or fourth century of the common era. And they had an origin myth similar to that of Rome actually. Their ruler was said to have been abandoned as a child after his father had been killed, um, but was suckled by a she-wolf and fed by a crow or a raven. Sometimes the sources vary. The Uyghur Turks of East Turkestan or today's Xinjiang in Western China claim their ancient Turkic ancestors, the Tilele, um, or Tiele, I'm, I don't speak Chinese, so I apologize. Um, that, that word means the high carts um, of the first century before the common era in the Lake Baikal area were the descendants of a male wolf and the daughter of a Hun ruler, or in, um, in one account, the Shan Yu of the Song Yu tribe. Some of the sources vary a bit. In a legend purported to be from the end of the fourth century, the Hun ruler locked his daughter, or sometimes two daughters, in a tower until a god from heaven came along in the form of a wolf and married her or married both of them. Um, having children who became the forefathers of the Turkic nation. Another myth from Chinese sources describes the founding of the Gokturk Empire or the Kokturks of the sixth to eighth century. I have a map here, uh, sorry, up here, this is sort of just a general map of the, the Gokturk Empire or the Gokturk Khanate, which does break down into two pieces, Eastern and Western. And then later um, the Uyghur uh, of, from the eighth century on, okay. Um, so this Chinese source describes the founding of the Gokturk Empire or the Kokturks of the sixth to eighth centuries. 
in which a branch of the Turkic Songnu Empire on the steppes of Central Asia named Ashina were attacked and all were killed by a neighboring kingdom except a 10 year old boy. The soldiers cut off his feet and threw him into a weedy marsh. A she wolf saved him, fed him, and when he grew up, she became his wife and became pregnant by him. A neighboring ruler sent troops to try to destroy him, but he had already been killed. A god in human form led his escaping wolf wife into the mountains north of the kingdom of Kocho, which is uh, near the area of Turfan, into a cavern with lush vegetation surrounded on all four sides by mountains. The wolf later gave birth to 10 boys. When they grew up and married, their wives became pregnant and each son had one, so, sorry, and each had one son who took a surname for their clan. And Ashina was the name of one of those clans. So the name Ashina gets repeated here. Chinese sources mentioned the Gokturk's banners often had a golden wolf head on them with a blue background. Um, this particular statue, and I don't know why these streaks are in my PowerPoint, but I apologize for that. Um, the, this is just a stele, a, a, a statue, what's left of it. Um, it's in Mongolia. Of the, the, it's supposed to be an illustration of this Ashina myth. Um, and it's a she-wolf suckling an amputee boy, but it's strange because both his arms and his legs have been amputated here. So um, it's kind of a strange image, all right? Um, and this is just an example of the rendition of what a Gokturk flag may have looked like based on the Chinese descriptions, right? Um, Gok or Kok, remember, um, implies blue, um, and so it implies the sky god Tanrı, right? The color blue, Gok or Kok, and told Turkish all meant, also meant sky or celestial, signifying the divine, divine empowerment of these Turks by the sky god Tandra or the heavens. According to historian Carter Finley, Ashina also means blue in an old Central Asian Iranian language. The old Turkic Uyghur word that used to describe the wolf in this story is Bori. And I, I'll just put these up here for you. Um, a term that Chinese sources say also referred to the bodyguard of warriors who protected the Khan, the Turkic tribal leader. Later myths of a blue wolf or kokbori are included in the Turkic Ouzname, an epic tradition surrounding the eponymous founder and hero Ouz and his fellow Turkic tribesmen who, after the fall of the Guk Turks, migrated westwards around the 9th century, founded a state around the 10th century in the Sirdarya River region, and a 15th century manuscript in Uyghur script copied from an earlier 14th century epic recounted the mythic origins of the Oğuz Turk clan, the superhuman qualities of their Khan and the military exploits of the Oğuz in, in a pre-Islamic narrative, which probably took place around the 10th or 11th centuries. Many of the episodes were entwined with the appearance of a bluish wolf, that's what it was called in the sources, who came to Oğuz's yurt in a beam of light and of course, this is indicative of divine intervention. One dawn morning to ask if he could lead the Oğuz Turks on a military campaign. The subsequent tales of battle included frequent mention of a large blue male wolf trotting ahead of the Oğuz warriors, guiding them forward before they inevitably scored victory after victory. The 16th century manuscript called the Book of Dede Korkut which likely derives from a 14th century Ouzname text, still possesses a residue of early Turkic wolf totemism. Although by the end of the 11th century, the Ouz had mainly converted to Islam so that the belief in the wolf as a direct ancestor was receding into history. The ferocity of the wolf now merely inspired the descendants of Ouz to bring forth their courageous warrior spirit to fight the non-Muslim infidels. Turkish language evolved in, to parallel these changes in totemic wolf belief. Though Buri and its variants are still used in many Central Asian Turkic languages today, the word fell into disuse in later centuries among the Islamized Oğuz Turkic tribes who migrated further west into the Middle East and into Anatolia. Fears of provoking the sacred wolf with if its name was uttered supposedly caused the Oğuz to replace the term Buri with the word thought to disguise any invocation that might incur Bori's wrath. So the word kurt, which means earthworm, um, but in contemporary Turkish parlance also means wolf, uh, was put in place here. Today, bozkurt or gray wolf is an expression to denote the actual animal in modern Turkey's Turkish vernacular. The Ashina origin myth is often known in Turkey today as bozkurt destane or the gray wolf epic. 
So these are just an illustration of how the language has changed a little bit. So this is Bozkurt Destane, is this Ashina myth that I've described about the 10 year old boy, right? Another prominent Central Asian myth, however, that circulated in the region is um, often known as the Ergenikon Efsanesi, the Ergenikon legend, shared by both Turkic and Mongol peoples. This folk legend has been attributed to the Uyghur Turks who established the Uyghur Khan Khanate around the eight, mid eighth to mid ninth centuries in Mongolia after the decline of the Gurk Turks. The Uyghurs continued to venerate the wolf as their ancestor, even after the kingdom was overrun by other Turkic tribes and they had migrated to the Tarim Basin, the Turfan Oasis area of Central Asia. A written version of this myth was reproduced by the Persian vizier Rashid Din Hamadani in his 14th century Jamia Tavarikh, the Compendium of Chronicles, commissioned by the Mongol Ilkhan Khan Razan and completed be between 1306 to 1311. The legend has been claimed by Uyghur Turks and by Turks in Turkey as originally a Turkic myth. And certain alterations to it seem to have been made in the contemporary versions published in Uyghur and in modern Turkish languages, which I'm going to explore a little bit more below. In Rashid Adin's 14th century account, he claims that the information comes from reliable Turkic sources, but it is presented as a Mongol myth tracing Chinggis Khan's origins, and it narrates as follows, quote, 2000 years prior to the birth of Chinggis Khan, after the Turks massacred the Mongols, only two princes, Nekuz and Piyan, in, and their wives survived. They escaped by following a narrow track to a plain surrounded by mountains called Ergenikon. They were supposedly the original Mongols. They multiplied and divided into tribes. 400 years later, when Ergenikon became too crowded, they fought their way out by blasting the iron mine tunnel using a bellows to create a big fire that broke through the mountainside on the advice of a blacksmith. And the image here is, is of breaking through this, um, this mountainside. Um, and you, this is the blacksmith. And of, of course, he, you know, the blacksmith guided them. This is probably the Khan and a wolf uh, at his side to illustrate that. Rashid Adin continues, trustworthy historians of the Turks report that all the Mongol tribes are descended from the two persons who went into Arganakan. Two, one of those who emerged from there was an important commander, a leader and chief of tribes, Bortuchine, or Blue Wolf by name. He had many wives and sons. By his chief wife, Koe Maral, or White Doe, he had a son, the most important of his sons, who attained rulership. His name was Batachi Kian. So Bortuchino is not an actual wolf in Rashid Adin's Ilkhanid Mongol account, but the name of an important tribal chieftain from whom the Mongols claimed their descent. His spouse was not a deer, but a woman named Koa Moral. However, in the secret history of the Mongols, a text probably written in Mongol Mongolian shortly after Chinggis Khan's death, circa the mid 13th century, in modified Uyghur Turkic script, but now lost except for a Chinese translation from the post-Mongol Ming period, the Yuan Chao Pishi. The ancestral origins of the Mongol leadership were introduced this way in a section entitled The Heritage and Youth of Chinggis Khan. There came into the world a blue gray wolf, Rotuchino, born of the sky god above, whose destiny was heaven's will. His wife was a fallow deer, Koemaral. They traveled together across the inland sea and when they were camped near the source of the Onan River, in sight of Mount Burhan Khaldun, their first son was born named Bachati Khan. So it's a similar, a similar story to this one, uh, to this Ergena Khan of San Asi. But whoops, but in this one, um, they, these are animals, right? Um, who become the, the ancestors of the Mongols. Whereas in the Turkic story, um, they're people's names. So, uh, and it, it may have something to do with the time period in which these stories floated about and whether uh, the authors or the, the narrators were Muslim or not uh, by that point. So this Mongol account um, does not have humanized protagonists as in Rashid Adin's Islamized Persian Mongol text, but actual animal ancestors consisting of a predator and prey, a common metaphor among nomadic peoples of the steppes such as the Mongols. Several Turkic cultures, including the Uyghur Turks, relate the same folkloric story of Ergena Khan, um, but there are modifications to the above stories in these versions. 
right? And the following legend, um, actually, before I, maybe before I say anything more, let me just show you this. These are, these are actually statues. Um, and Elena, thank you for helping me track this down a little bit. Um, she helped me here. Um, these are a couple of statues that um, are, are in Mongolia. They are supposedly in a, in a nature park near Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia today. So um, this is Bortuchina and this is uh, the deer, Koemaral. Again, I don't know why these streaks are through my entire PowerPoint. I apologize, so you'll just have to ignore those. Um, but this is the Mongol perception is these were the, 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 um, the actual ancestors were animals, divinely inspired animals. Um, so, but the, the, the Uyghur story is a little bit different. Um, and the following, this following legend um, was said to have appeared in uh, Shajeri Turk, the genealogy of the Turks, um, which was uh, authored by the Khan of Khiva, uh, Abu Ghazi Bahadur Khan. And he completed this around uh, 1659. So, you know, now we're talking about um, obviously a, a more um, uh, most is Islamic era, right? A later Islamic era here. Once upon a time when Uyghurs were defeated in battle, they found themselves trapped halfway up the mountainside. Because they could not find a way to escape, they were faced with total annihilation. Just at that critical moment, they saw a bluish wolf run down the mountain. And in their desperation, they simply followed him. When they reached the foot of the mountain, they saw the wolf disappear into a very large cave. The Uyghurs followed him into the cavern and there walked in darkness for a while, um, for quite a long time. Um, eventually, they could see an opening at the other end. They continued to follow the wolf through this gap into a grassland paradise, blessed by a soft breeze and a flowing river. By following this wolf, the Uyghurs were able to save themselves. And that is why, since that time, Uyghurs have regarded the wolf as a divine being whom they venerated. So this is actually an image um, of this Ergenicon Efsane C. Uh, again, and I'm going to say something more about this, this particular image and where it is today in Turkey um, at the end of the, of the lecture here. Um, but upon closer inspection of the original sources, um, we, we actually realized that Behadur Khan is not describing the Uyghur Turks, but just as in Rashid ad-Din's opus, those escaping were the descendants of the Mongol princes, uh, Nekuz and Kriyan. So Behadur Khan does say he used many other texts besides Rashid ad-Din's compendium, to produce his genealogy, but I found no pre-modern Turkic textual accounts like this one above, that, that this one here, um, that specifically mentioned the Uyghur Turks as those escaping Ergenikon, nor that it was a wolf who'd led them through a cave and into the lush plain or described above. So the, the sources are very muddled here. The Central Asian historian uh, Devin Deweese does recount the words of a Syriac chronicler of the 12th century, Michael the Syrian, who narrates how the Turks migrated, eventually reaching Anatolia, quote, guided by an animal resembling a dog that guided earlier generations in their emergence and migrations. Its supernatural character is clear for it walked before them, but they could not approach it. After, after having led them for a long time, it disappeared." End quote. In fact, the Uyghur legend mentioned above seems to be a grafting of elements of the earlier she-wolf Ashina uh, onto the elements of the Ergenikon legend and the Ouzname stories of the blue wolf leading Ouz forces on campaign. It's possible these myths were first assimilated into one overarching tale by Hamdala Mustafi, um, an administrator and historian of Arab descent hailing from Qazvin in uh, uh, Iran, who served under the Ilkhanid Mongols and who enjoyed the patronage of Rashid ad-Din. He wrote his world history entitled Tarih Gozida uh, around the year 1330, in which it is reported that while Rashid ad-Din's compendium was his primary source, he incorporated some oral narratives such as the intrusion of the wolf into the mythical enclosure and Ergenikon. It is perhaps Mustafi's version that then made its way into present day Uyghur Turkish folklore. So it's a, a real con, uh, uh, conglomeration of different stories here. Added to the confusion over cultural possession of this mythology, Rashid ad-Din's Persia Mongol text claims in several places that quote, the Mongols were a nation or a tribe of the Turks. Though the context indicates he means this relation was only from very ancient times and these peoples were now ethnically distinct tribes. Um, a contemporary Uyghur scholar, Asad Suleiman, reproduced this legend as follows. Um, and this is the cover of his book. And I'll, I'll quote him here. Uh, there was no wolf in this land. One day it appeared so suddenly and attacked a deer. Our man saw all the details on the spot. The wolf guided us through a cave. Blacksmiths use their skills and knowledge. 
They melted stones and opened a way. All the barriers disappeared and we were rescued. Great happiness came to us. The whole nation celebrated with one another. We set up our yurts in this holy land, joining together the elders, women, and children. The gray wolf became our symbol. We elected our Khan to his throne. He stood in front and guided us, holding our flag in his right hand. Burtuccini was the name of the wolf. Ergenikun was the name of our land. We lived here more than 400 years and our people became greater than before." End quote. Notable in this Uyghur related myth is that the wolf's name is said to be Bochchine, which is the Mongol vocabulary for blue wolf. The Uyghur author must have used the Persian Mongol versions of this legend to reconstruct it as a Turkic myth, or the wolf's name would not have appeared in Mongol, but would have been the Turkic Kokbure. And eventually making its way into the later Ottoman Turks, the Ergenikon myths resurfaced and was popular in the late Ottoman Empire, though it can differ slightly from between the two. Um, there's some elements in, in common. And if anybody wants to, to read the Ottoman one, I can, I can read that later, but I'll go on. The relevance of these Turco-Mongolian wolf myths becomes apparent when considering the content of the legends, as well as the historiographical arguments made to legitimate them as particularly Turkic cultural possessions, that is, as Turkic national heritage. First, most contemporary recounting of Uyghur Turkic folklore about the folklore about the ancient ancestors and the Oul uses Kokburi. Or um, in Suleiman's work, Kok Tukluk Kok Yaluk Bir Arkakbure, a blue-haired, blue-maned wolf in describing him. Using blue as a way to reconnect with their antiquity and with the sky god Tangra, their pre-Islamic Guk Turk ancestry, insinuating an unbroken lineage to a divine celestial origin. Second, the wolf came to represent a guide, inspiring Turkic warriors, symbolizing the masculine courage of Turks and the strength to overcome enemies. The Turkish scholar Ogel uh, claims that the description of the wolf as a blue wolf signifies it as the seasoned uh, old leader of the pack whom all follow because of his wisdom, his cunning and fierceness, and that this blue sky color was sometimes used to describe hair turned gray, the sign of experience which I think many of us can relate to that one. Um, third, the mythologies of fleeing or seeking refuge in an isolated place such as a cave or the Ergenikon plain surrounded by mountains, followed by initial survival, demographic increase and resurgence as a powerful people illustrates Turkic tribes experience of what historian Devin Deweese labels the quote, protective ancestral unpleasure and a communal emergence, end quote themes that resurface in later Turkish literature and ideology quite frequently. It is a pattern that fit nicely as a national metaphor taken up by the Ottoman Turks at the end of World War I to assist in mobilizing the Turkish people and their establishment of a modern Turkish Republic. For the Uyghur Turks, the wolf myths are employed to argue for autonomy and nationhood as the desired emergence from their enclosure by and within the larger Chinese political system today, which we are, I think, much more aware of even now. So how does this, uh, how do these myths now, then how do they start to function in the modern era? Um, folklore that privileged the wolf as a divinely inspired symbol of Turkic culture had faded into the background for many of the peoples descending from the Oulu's Turk tribes who migrated west and who converted to Islam. And over time, you know, they adopted a more settled existence. Um, as previously mentioned, Later Oulu's literature, such as the Book of Dede Korkut, occasionally mention the wolf, but no longer as a divine ancestor, but rather as a predator to be watchful of, notable for its ferocity, which Turkish warriors had a duty to match. With the rise, of one, uh, of, with the rise to power of one of the migrating Oulu's clans, the Seljuk Turks, who expanded into the Islamic lands of Persia, they assimilated imperial Persianate culture, and with it, the wolf motif was replaced actually by the lion as a more regal symbol of authority. The Seljuks eventually Islamized and Turkicized Anatolia between the 11th and 12th centuries, and the Sunni Islamic foundations were laid for the later Ottoman dynasty to establish itself as a state. As the Ottomans settled into royal existence as a world empire and religious life became associated with a kind of Islamic orthodoxy, which looked less favorably upon shamanistic heresies of the, by the 16th century, the wolf as a divine ancestor or icon of Turkic power faded or disappeared completely. Now the wolf was merely represented in Ottoman miniature paintings as one of the many wild animals subject to the tradition of Sultan's royal hunts, 
such as depicted here. This is uh, Ottoman Sultan Murat I in the 14th century. So now the wolf is actually becoming hunted. And for good reason, I, I imagine. The, the Ottoman Empire needed to feed its armies and its cities and with requisite numbers of livestock. Um, this provisioning endeavor that the Ottomans had to undertake meant predators such as wolves would be con considered like most attitudes about wolves prevailing in Europe to be more of a nuisance than any symbol of political and military power. Prominent young Ottoman writers and journalists, however, and even uh, officials of the Tanzimat reform era uh, in between 1839 to 1876, started to exploit the language and civilization of the Turkish race, their interests having been piqued by European scholarship on the subject. So for example, in this late Ottoman era, in 1863, the distinguished Ottoman statesman and multilingual man of letters, Ahmed Vefik Pasha, translated Bahadur Khan's uh, 17th century Shajere Turk from Chagatai Turkish into Ottoman Turkish as Ushali Shajere Turki and published it in the Ottoman newspaper Tasviri Efkar in Constantinople. This was likely the first exposure of the Ergenekon legend to the Ottoman Turkish reading public which encouraged the tale to be absorbed into Turkish consciousness as a myth of ancient national origins and struggles against enemies. In addition, Turkic Muslims from Russia, many of whom were, in, in, from the Caucasus as well, many of whom were intellectuals interested in the roots of Turkic culture became ideologues of pan-Turanism, right? As a response to pan-Slavism. This mid 19th century movement demanded the unification of all peoples in the Euro-Altaic language family in their ancient land called Turan from Hungary and Finland to the Turks, Mongols, and Manchus of Asia. These Turkic elites emigrated from the Russian empire in the 19th century to escape the pressures of Russification and Christianization. As exiles, they ended up residing in the Ottoman empire where they found careers as journalists and writers propagating their ideas and giving rise to a more ethno-linguistically exclusive and proto-nationalist pan-Turkism movement in the Ottoman empire that was heavily influenced by them. As pan-Turkist intellectuals in the Ottoman lands witnessed a reversal of their empire's fortunes and almost constant war mobilization starting in the Balkan Wars in 1911, poets and literateurs extolled the greatness of the Turkish nation in the face of adversity by resurrecting and employing versions of the Bozkur Destane, the Grey Wolf epic or Ashina legend, and the Ergenekon Destane, the Ergenekon saga, as metaphors of contemporary Turkish nationalist struggles. Shevket Sureya, an instructor at the Ottoman Iderna Teachers College during the Balkan Wars, recalled in his memoirs that, quote, everyone was practically idolizing the legendary symbols of Ergenekon and Bozkurt, so intoxicated were they with the, the new idea of Turan. Omer Seyfeddin was a military officer, teacher, and writer at the forefront of the new language, the Yeni Lisanla uh, language movement, propagated by the Ottoman journal Genç Kalemle, or Young Pens, which promoted the purging of foreign words, Persian and Arabic, for example, from the Turkish language. In Yeni Gün Ergenekon Dan Çukış, a poem in the form of a dialogue between the Grey Wolf of Bozkurt and the Turks, published in the Ottoman journal Halkodoru in April of 1914. Seyfetin draws on the myth of the Turks having been trapped in the Ergenekon plain, surrounded by mountains for 400 years until a wolf of Bozkurt led them to freedom, exclaiming how they must reclaim ancient Turan. Seyfeddin's poetic meter, including reference to a fallow deer as Animiz, our mother, reminiscent of the, or, the Mongol origin myth, was his way to suggest that it was now time for the Turks to emerge from their, their current metaphorical Ergenekon. Was this Ottoman wartime conditions, perhaps he meant? Ignorance, uh, lack of independent nationhood, what was, there, what was he talking about as Ergenekon, to expand into all of Turan? Another prominent intellectual, uh, an Ottoman writer familiar to all of us, a political activist named Zia Gokel, was known by many as the architect of Turkish nationalism. He penned an epic poem entitled Turk Ananesi Ergenekon, the Turkish tradition Ergenekon, that was published in 1913 in the Ottoman journals Turk Duygusu and Altin Arman the latter a supplement to Turk Yurdu, and republished as Ergenekon in a book called uh, Kuzil Elma in, in 1914. And if you want to know about Kuzil Elma, I can talk about that. In it, he traces Turkic origins, conquests, and encounters with other peoples from time immemorial, blending elements of the various Turko-Mongol Central Asian myths 
the, the characters of Nokuz and Kian, they're mentioned as fleeing into the mountains where they remain for 400 years. <clears throat> There's mention of a fallow deer, Alagaik, and of a shepherd witnessing the sudden unexpected appearance of a wolf where there had previously been none who attacked a deer, a divine sign perhaps. They conducted metalworking. As Gulkalp's poetry relates, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to read the, the Turkish here, but I have the English translation up there. Kurt bir delik buldu, gitti. Bir demirci takip etti. Ocak yakta taş eriti. Açıldı yo kapa emez. And the poem continued. Demirci e bozkur dendi. Han tanıldı, taç giyildi. Yoldan önce kendi indi. Sa elinde baramez. Burtucine kurdan ade, ergenekan yurdan ade. Dort yüz sene durdun hadi, çık ay, yüz bin mizramiz. It's very exciting. So comparing the Turks experience to the biblical Jonah exiting the whale, Gokalp says, quote, from a small homeland to a great homeland, we joined the deer in the enclosed plain and were born of a wolf. Our sickle became a sword, quote. And again, if the Turk's foot treads upon any homeland, his head bowed to the wolf. Gokkan here, Akhan there, we said, and our feet went, end quote. He made Turk's territorial claims to the lands of Turan, the ancient homeland stretching from India and China all the way to the Danube, as well as extolling the Turkic dynasties across time and place, from the Gok Turks and Uyghurs to Oğuz Khan, the Ghaznavids, the Seljuks, Attila to Timur, the Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II, Fatih Mehmet, to Babur, the Mughal dynasty in India, and finished with a pan-Turkist claim that, quote, upon a land entering your hand, think it becomes Ergenekon again. Won't Burtishine appear? Will not our torch be alight with glory? End quote. So the role of Bozkurt, the gray wolf in this literature, is most reminiscent of the mythic blue-haired, blue-maned male wolf of the Turkic Oğuz Name who had led the Oz Turks on their military campaigns. By the late Ottoman era, Bozkurt had become a symbol of the timeless and perpetual existence of the Turkish nation across the ages and of pan-Turkish nationalist aspirations to reclaim the former grandeur of earlier Turkic peoples, but this time with the Turks of Anatolia at the head of great, this great people. This symbol of Ural Altaic pan-Turkism would be appropriated more specifically for Anatolian Turks by the second decade of the 20th century. A timely historical moment, the Western Allies' disastrous Gallipoli campaign of 1915 and the successful defense of Gallipoli, Gallipoli by Ottoman forces. This would provide the Turkish hero who could assume the stature of the gray wolf, leading the Turkish nation out of its Ottoman conflagration, Mustafa Kemal, a military commander assigned to lead an Ottoman division in defending the Dardanelles during World War I. Ataturk, as he was later known, the future first president of the Turkish Republic, would come to embody the charismatic gray wolf in human form, leading the way to modernity. It is he who would first guide the Turkish people out of the Ottoman imperial failures and wartime leadership, out of the ashes of Ottoman defeat in the Great War at the hands of Western powers, out of the potential parceling off of Anatolia into European territories with the Treaty of Sevres and plans for foreign occupation leading nationalist forces in a successful war of independence against Western colonial intentions and the 1919 Greek invasion and out of the shackles of an Ottoman Islamic past, out of ignorance and the illiteracy of the masses into secular, educated Turkish independent nationhood. A poem written by a Bulgarian Turk, Mehmet Behçet Pirim, published in the Ottoman new newspaper Ahali, in 1922 entitled Bozkurt is an exaltation of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk and his emerging Turkish nation, mixing ancient mythology with modern exigencies. The gray wolf is the Turk's miracle. He is his deliverer. It is he who brought the Turk out of Ergenekon. Your first ancestor is the Turk's every story of perseverance, he wrote. Um, and I have the whole uh, the whole poem here, but I think I, I know I'm going to end up running late if I try and read all this. So um, I can always send this to some to people or we can go back to this slide and you can take a look at it and read it better. But obviously he's combining um, the past and the present here um, when he talks about uh, the gray wolf, right? And looking at the, the, the contemporary era or his contemporary era. 
He was a journalist who eventually emigrated to Turkey in 1927. Um, and his sentiments were repeated in much of the literature that appeared in subsequent years. During the Turkish War of Independence between 1919 and 1922, some commanders began to be called Bozkurt because of their shrewd strategic military leadership, though Mustafa Kemal ultimately assumed the preeminent position of the Turkish nationalist Grey Wolf. Official pronouncements from the pre-Republican era Grand National Assembly and the eventual Ankara government were officially stamped but the symbol of the Bozkurt, right? I have a couple examples here for you. Turkey's first passenger liner was named Bozkurt. Early Republican era banknotes and stamps had a wolf on them, uh, like these. A wolf figurine was given as a gift to Ataturk to commemorate a court decision made at The Hague in 1927 concerning the sinking of the Bozkurt ferry. It was, uh, a, a, there was a collision on the water with a, a, with a French ship, I believe it was, and the French had to pay damages. Um, you can see that statue today in a museum, by the way. The Bozkurt gray wolf images were the, the crest or symbol of the, of the Turkish research facilities and government offices, et cetera, throughout the 1920s and 30s. And a British military officer, H.C. Armstrong, penned an English language biography of Ataturk that was published um, uh, in 1932 entitled Bozkurt. I have the cover there. Um, it was initially banned in Turkey for some of its less fat, flattering assessments of Ataturk's personality and behavior, but eventually it was translated and published in Turkish in 1955. Um, and so here's, you know, this is just a second. There's, this is an earlier um, edition and then a, a little bit later edition, apparently. Um, the 1920s was to be an era of modernizing national reforms, collectively known as Kemalism, promulgated by the Grey Wolf himself, Ataturk, whose actions continued to be understood as that enlightened and fiercely brave Bozkurt leading his Turkish people out of the Ergenekon of backwardness, traditionalism, and ignorance to Western-oriented modernity and statehood. Described as, quote, one of the world's greatest mythoclasts and myth makers, Ataturk proceeded to invoke some of the pre-Islamic and pre-Ottoman Turkish stereotypes or archetypes, including the er Ergenekon epic as a mythic antecedent for the war of independence under his leadership. In Ataturk, his nation found a, a sacred embodiment of collective aspirations, the presiding spirit of the historical myth projected into the future. Writers pursued the task of linking myth with current Kamalist leadership accordingly with their activities. And in the early Republican era, there was more literature that did this. Uh, Dr. Reza Noor, an intellectual and politician who became more involved in the irredentist pan-Turkish journals in Turkey in the 1940s. He began his endeavor to promote racially defined Turkish nationalism and the unity of all Turks by translating yet again Bahadur Khan's Genealogy of the Turks with its myths of Turco-Mongol enclosure and escape into modern Turkish, though still in Ottoman script in 1925. Not only the mythology, but Bahadur Khan's genealogical charting of Turkic generations was contained in this volume uh, to link people to their Central Asian and pre-Islamic roots. Yakub Kadri Karasmanolu, uh, an eminent writer and friend of Ataturk, had, has been accused of having manipulated the er Erdogan, uh, Ergenekon legend into a Turkish nationalist myth by, during this time by linking the tale to events establishing Turkish Republic that, uh, in his collection of essays originally published in 1928 as Ergenekon, Mili Yazalara, Ergenekon Writings of a National Struggle. Kara Osmanolu is said to be the first author to have connected this, this saga now portrayed as the existential battle of the Guk Turk ancestors of modern day Turks to survive as a race, imprisoned in Ergenekon and liberated through the help of the wolf to contemporary historical events surrounding the, the founding of modern Turkey. Um, there's other examples of this. Um, the, in the 1930s, the Ergenekon, Ashina and Bozkurt stories became enshrined as part of, Tur part of Turkey's national culture with their inclusion in the Turkish Ministry of Education's textbooks. Um, the efforts to cultivate a stronger sense of Turkishness among the general population were stepped up by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk himself and his offices when they pursued the drafting of the Turkish history thesis in 1930 in a book called Turk Tarihinin Ana Hatlara, The Main Tenets of Turkish History, to be quickly replaced when the recently formed Turk Tarih Kurumu, the Turkish Historical Society, published a four volume history textbook for high schools for the academic year 1931 to 32. Students chanted slogans like our past is a model, a rejoicing for the gray wolves. History Congresses were held to propagate the ideas of Central Asian pre-Islamic origins, 
Turkish racial nationalhood, nationhood, uniqueness, and the civilized genius and superiority of the Turks above all others. At the same time that the gray wolf image became prolific in Turkish daily life as a primordial symbol representing the perennial nature of the Turkish people. Quote, the gray wolf figure was reproduced everywhere on money, on cigarette packages, on the hats of school children. As the emblem of the Turkish Ministry of Education, the Turkology Institute, the National Turkish Students Association, Turkish, Turkic, Her, Turkish Herths, the first national oil company, Petrol Ofisi, the Turkish Boy Scouts or Scouts. I mean, these are all just some examples of, of uh, this iconography. So Kamala's Turkish nationalism centered around Anatolia as the Turkish homeland and Pan-Turkism with its broader Turanist claims of the unity of all Turks across Asia were ideological currents which both ascribed the idea uh, of a particularistic Turkish racial nationhood and the primacy of Turks. The Pan-Turkists tended to be anti-Western, irredentist, and obviously anti-Soviet and anti-communist. The Kamalists desiring, uh, desired orienting Turkey um, toward the West, and they used the Turkish history thesis and the sun language theory to imply this kind of universality, that ancient Turkish civilization and not Greek civilization was the foundation upon which all others, including those of the West, were based. Both ideologies, however, drew on similar symbols of nationhood, such as Turks' contributions to world civilizations, the importance of language, and of course, the Bozkurt motif. As scholars argue, this was to block other claims to Turkic lands, whether in Central Asia, um, Soviet and Chinese demands, for example, or Armenian and Kur Kur Kurdish demands in Anatolia, respectively. But the Turkish Republican government started to limit its use of the Grey Wolf icon as a way of distancing itself from radical nationalism, as the Pan-Turkist movement increasingly appropriated the wolf and crescent moon as their ultra-nationalist insignia in the 1940s during World War II. The translating editors of the book of Dede Karkut um, mentioned that the official emblem of the Republic of Turkey had a wolf's head along with the star and crescent, but this disappeared when Ismet Inonu came to power after the death of Ataturk in 1938. The famous writer, novelist, and philosopher Hussein Nihal Atsiz espoused his pan-Turkist ideas first rather moderately in his, his first journal, uh, Atsiz Mejmua, before becoming ever more radical in his Turkism with the later Orhun. Uh, and I have, there we go, a uh, picture of that. Um, it bore the phrase on the masthead, all Turks are one army, as you can see there, as well as the gray wolf and crescent moon symbol on the cover. Pan-Turkist racial nationalism of the 1930s and 1940s had gained an international boost from the rise of fascist ultranationalism in Europe and elsewhere at this time, illustrating the transnational nature of this thought at mid-century. Atsis, for example, admired Nazi, Nazi racial theories and often described this, the Turks as a, quote, master race, believing that, quote, pan-Turkism should be achieved by war, since the Turks were skilled in the arts of war, among other things. Similar publications resulted from this racist pan-Turkism, such as the monthly Ergenikon, published by Reza Oğuz Turkan uh, in 1938. Not only did the magazine's heading read the Turkish race above everything, but a drawing of the gray wolf on the steps uh, appeared on the cover. It lasted for only four issues, but Turkan continued with his radical pan-Turkism in Bozkurt, another journal he published starting in 1939. Although, um, uh, Bozkurt was actually suspended briefly before restarting in 1940 and lasting until 1942. And in 1942, Turkan actually published his racial ultranationalist credo in uh, Bozkurt. Um, and I have the whole text of it is here. Again, I mean, um, you know, uh, the, the point of all this is to just kind of talk, to, to point out that in the 1940s, you know, when worldwide we have, you know, Nazi Germany, we have Mussolini in Italy. Um, and, and so ultranationalism uh, and fascism are on the rise in the world. And so this is just a trend in that, in that direction during that time period in the 1940s. So you can go back and read that if you want. This is my translation. Um, you can find it in Turkish and uh, in various sources as well uh, as my translation here. Um, but in both Bozkurt and in his next, uh, also more vehemently racist and ultranationalist journal, Gokboru, uh, which means blue wolf, right? In Central Asian Turkic language. It was published in Istanbul between 1942 to 1943. He recuperated the slogan of the Turkish race above everything, as well as the gray wolf 
uh, and Crescent Moon, explaining the meaning of the journal's name and symbol in the first issue. And here, um, th this is how he explains Blue Wolf. Gokuboru means gray wolf, which is considered the unifying symbol of all Turks. It is believed that the Turks are the descendants of the gray wolf, which led them since an immemorial time. Whenever they're decentralized, the flag of the gray wolf has become the unifying signal so that great Turkish unity has been formed. It is the father of all Turks and its spirit always observes the Turks. If there is a hard situation, God sends the Turks a gray wolf manifested in the body and spirit of the most superior Turk. The brave, militant, and hardworking spirit of the first gray wolf is manifested in these other gray wolves. In that case, all Turks should work idealistically for the rise of the Turkish race in order to be gray wolves." End quote. So, you know, this is in the 1940s, um, and we start, start seeing um, some of this, um, this sort of um, ultra-nationalist rhetoric being directed um, after the war even towards um, communists in the 1960s um, and into the 1970s as well, um, towards leftists, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip over stuff because I realize I'm, I'm, I don't want to go too long and I want to have more time for questions. So I'm going to kind of move ahead here. Um, but what eventually ends up happening here, and you know, um, Nazim Hikmet Ran uh, also has a, a poem here. Of course, he was in prison for a long time. Um, he was as a communist, um, but he actually is is um, you know he wrote an ode to Ataturk. He dedicated it, calling him the Mavi Gözlü Sarışın Kurt Üzerine, um, and so there is this transformation, let's call it, where we have um, the sort of ultra-nationalism that you know, is fomenting in the 1940s, uh, goes into the 1950s and 60s as, a, as an ultra-nationalist Turkic movement. And they sort of, you know, it, it's different than talking about Ataturk as the Bozkurt. Ataturk was the hero of World War I, the hero at Gallipoli, the, you know, the first president. Um, the founder of the modern, you know, the secular modern Turkish nation. Um, and so that is one kind of um, use of Bozkurt in iconography is to talk about Ataturk that way um, as Bozkurt. But what the gray wolves do is much more radical um, and um, activist uh, directed towards um, those whom they see as threats to the Turkish Republic. And that can be, as I said, Armenians and Kurds, Alevis, um, leftists, um, students, the protests, etc. Um, there's a lot of different different ways in which this, uh, you know, sort of evolves. So, so let's as uh, wrapping up here. Um, what about the gray wolves today? So for for militant Turkish ultra nationalists today, um, they had initially become more vocal in the 1930s amid that international climate of fascism. Um, oops. Um, Bozkurt had continued to evolve, uh, evoke a more racially charged meaning behind Turkish identity. Atsuz and Turkan's radical pan-Turkish ideas had heavily influenced the Ukuju or the ultra-nationalist Turkish movement and its leaders, including the right-wing nationalist movement party, the Mehepe founder and president, Alparslan Turkesh. Today, there are websites dedicated to Atsuz and his brand of pan-Turkism, most of which incorporate the Bozkurt and Ergenekon visual images and legends into the nationalist rhetoric. And what are the Grey Wolves activities at the beginning? Abdullah Çatla, um, a high-ranking Grey Wolves member in the 19, from the 1950s to the 1990s, apparently provided the gun for Mehmet Ali Aja when he attempted the assassination of Pope John Paul II in 1981. It seemed that Aja had operated under Bozkurt Jalar orders, but even that episode led to a complicated story of the sinister side of the Bozkurt Jalar. Their transnational connections to fascist groups and international organized crime, including the drug trade and weapons dealing, as well as a secret relationship with the Turkish government and even the CIA. When Çatla was killed in the Susurluk car crash in 1996, accompanied by Turkish officials, the deep state counter guerrilla activities carried out by the Grey Wolves were exposed. Ergenekon today in contemporary Turkey is most well known because of the Ergenekon scandal an investigating investigation starting in 2001, resulting in the uncovering of a clandestine organization named Ergenekon, whose members were understood to be part of the underground secular ultranationalist deep state in Turkey, who had been accused, and by 2011, over 500 of whom had been arrested on charges of terrorism, political violence, and assassinations, including the shooting of Armenian journalist Tarat Dink. 
and their intention to overthrow the legitimately elected Turkish government of Prime Minister Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, the AKP. Many of them have been acquitted on the charges or their convictions were overturned, however, and they were also initially implicated in that murder of Hrant Dink, those, but those accusations were proven false. Today's Turkey's gray wolves are still acting as militant guardians of the Republic's Turkish national identity. Um, there's now a tacit political alliance between Erdogan's Islamist AKP party and the nationalist MHP party, with the latter's gray wolves still operating as a militant wing, even though they, they have been banned in, I think in Germany and in uh, Austria in a coalition that increasingly disseminates anti-Kurdish, anti alevi and anti-European sentiments. With the split of the MHP membership in 2016 over accepting President Erdogan's new constitution, former MHP member and nationalist Meral Akshener, who had previously been a Turkish min interior minister, started her new political party called the Good Party, Yi Party, to challenge the authoritarianism of the AKP. She has been symbolically nicknamed the she-wolf Ashina, by her supporters. Actually, I think they call it Asina. They don't say Ashina. It's a little, little odd. And in recent years, Turkey's gray wolves have adopted the cause of the Uyghur Turk struggle against the Chinese government as their own. Following Thailand's forced repatriation of 100 Uyghur refugees to China, the gray wolves were visibly involved in attacks on the Thai embassy in Ankara and Thai consulate in Istanbul in July of 2015. A deadly explosion at a Bangkok Hindu Buddhist shrine in August 2015 had investigators linking the bombing to the Grey Wolves. So um, I, I'm going to skip um, talking about Chechnya and I'm just going to say the last little thing here that I wanted to say about wolves. So the mythic wolf of Turkic legends, whether called Ashina, Kokbori, or Gokbore, uh, Burtichino, or Bozkurt, has survived over the centuries to become a symbol of Turkish national strength though the interpretations of this Turko-Mongol folklore have been and continue to be deployed by various Turkic or uh, Turkish individuals or groups to suit their societal, military, and political purposes. The wolf played a role in shamanistic or polytheistic religious belief. The wolf inspired the call to battle and this fierceness and bravery to win and defeat enemies. The wolf represented resistance to foreign enemy forces intent upon subduing the people. A wolf uh, played a role in defining identity, who was considered part of a nation, and what the characteristics of that people would or should be. The Turkic wolf was a nurturing maternal she-wolf, a direct ancestor, a masculine figure to provide Turkic peoples on military campaign, or a political leader showing the way to achieve national greatness. Ashina, Kokbori, Burtuchino, and the Ergenikon legends have transformed into a modern Bozkurt narrative for Turks in Anatolia at the turn of the 20th century with a heroic gray wolf in human form, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and all that he represented for the emerging Turkish Republic. Bozkurt in this modern context functioned as a metaphor for Turkish military victory against all odds, as well as for the resurrection of Turkish nationhood and Western oriented Kemalist progress in Anatolia. Bozkurt was also shared by more radical ultranationalist Turks, whose grandiose vision of the superior Turkic nation stretched through and beyond Anatolian borders, and which militantly demanded these Turkish aspirations be met at the expense of other peoples and territories. Today, the wolf continues to be embraced as the mark of courageous and spirited struggle by Turkic and other peoples in regions in which their nationalist ambitions have not yet been met, such as the Uyghurs and the Chechens, uh, that I can say something about if you want. Perhaps most symbolic of all is the reality of wolves' resili resiliency as a top predator in the wild, hunted almost to extinction in some areas of the world by its human adversaries, yet able to survive, adjust to contemporary circumstances, and to reemerge with its predatory inclinations intact, yet now also to be recognized as a fundamental player in the ecological balance and defended by environmentalists. The wolf in the wild is a metaphor for the struggle of the nation, the real life miracle of the wolf's enduring life force and appeal will guarantee the longevity of the wolf in nationalist iconography for many years to come. And the last thing I, you know, I mentioned this picture before. Um, this is quite interesting, and I, I'll just I'll share with you um, where this is from. I think I'm going to have to end my show in order to to do it, um, but I can give you some information about it. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, 
when Tur when Ataturk's central office of the culture and educational Turkish hearths was built between 1927 to 1930 in what today houses the State Art and Sculpture Museum in Ankara, at, at Ataturk's specific request, that very well-known painting depicting the migration out of Ergenekon by the famous, it was done by the famous Turkish artist Ratif Tahir Burak and is entitled Ergenekon One. It was actually hung at the top of the stairs leading to the upper floor of that building. Uh, so Ataturk had a, had a direct hand in, um, in wanting to um, have that picture displayed you know, publicly. So now it's in a museum in Ankara if you'd like to see it. <laughs>